What's going on YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to sit down and talk about all my audio gear that I take to weddings. I actually get this question a lot and on my last video I got a comment asking about some of the audio gear that we use. So today we're gonna to go ahead and dive straight into it and talk about the audio gear that I use. So one of the first things I wanna start off by saying is that I am a big fan of organization. And so I know I have like an audio case and a lighting case and my camera case. I don't build these cases because like that's what the big sets look like and they got all these cases that they show up with. It's more so just so that I know where everything is. If I need something audio related, it's all in one place. If I need something camera related, all of that's all in one place. I'm a big fan of being organized and I can't tell you how many times I see this, but but a lot of filmmakers in the industry, not just weddings, they just throw their stuff in the moving cart and call it a day. And to me, I'm just like, how do you find anything when you need it? So that being said, my audio case is inside a Nano, 935. It's very similar to a Pelican 1510. I actually went for the Nano case because it was a little bit cheaper on Amazon, but it was also one that was in stock and I just needed something that was big enough to pack everything into. Inside the case, I use the regular padded dividers that's provided by Nanook. This is another thing that I like a little bit more than Pelican. Their dividers are a little bit thinner and allow for more gear, but they also give you more dividers in general. I remember when I got my Pelican case, I probably got about five or six. I'm just ballparking numbers and the Nanook, I got about 20. So just for comparison, you get a lot more with the Nanook cases than you do with Pelican. My go-to lapel mic system is the Sennheiser AVX system. I could probably do an entire review on these mics by themselves, but one of the main things that I love about it is that they auto-normalize your, your audio. If someone's talking and they suddenly yell, the mic itself like compresses it and it never clips by the time it gets to your camera. In a regular scenario, if someone's reading their vows or they suddenly laugh or they get really quiet and then they burst out really loud, the mic does a fantastic job of just balancing that and making sure you never actually have bad sounding audio. Now, I'm not saying that you need to just set your gain on your camera and forget about it. You still want to monitor it. But again, the mic itself does a really good job at just keeping everything compressed within a certain window, preventing any type of clipping. Another one of my favorite things about the Sennheiser system is that it runs on the 1.9 gigahertz spectrum. Now I'm not a big like gigahertz spectrum type of guy. I'm not Gerald Undone. I'm not gonna break this down scientifically for you. All I know and the best way to like make it make sense is that 90% of everything else runs on 2.4, which is like your Wi-Fi band. The reason that I'm bringing this up is because we provided live streaming at the beginning of the whole pandemic and it was really hard to keep getting consistent audio. I kept having dropouts. Since I switched to the Sennheiser system, which is on the 1.9, everything else like the Wi-Fi transmitters, the wireless transmitters that's going from the cameras to the Sling Studio never interfered with the mic setup because it was basically running on its own highway all by itself. You can purchase this as just the regular wireless kit, which is the one where you have your body pack and your transmitter, the lapel setup, or you can also buy the version where it actually comes with a handheld mic. I love that microphone. That's the microphone that I use in the middle of the dance floor to grab sound bites. Congrats, Morgan and Lance. So happy for y'all. Now that mic you can buy separately. I actually picked mine up just solo. I already had the AVX systems and you can always repair one of your receivers to the mic, uh, which is what I do because I don't always use this mic, but whenever I want to use it or want to grab some guest interviews or just some random sound bites, I want to be able to pair it to the camera and have the audio run directly into it. I hope you live a uh, long, lavish life. And that's about it. My backup recorder is the Rode Filmmaker Kit. I actually really, really love the Rode Filmmaker Kit. The only issue that I have with it at this day and age is that it's just huge. Like no one wants to walk around with a brick attached to their hip. The Rode Filmmaker Kit pretty much comes in handy if there's a sudden first look, maybe with a bride and her dad, or if I wanna throw a mic on the dad during the ceremony or something else happens and I need to just throw a mic around the speaker. That's typically where that mic comes in. Uh, it's still an amazing, good quality sounding mic. I just, it's not my go-to mic. The actual lapel mics that I use with the Sennheiser are the Sennheiser MKE-2. These are incredibly small microphones and I really love them because of how small they are, but they also sound incredible. I remember sitting on stage eight years ago during It's a Wonderful Life, talking to Heather saying, yeah, I'm gonna marry that girl. 
These mics being so tiny, you would think that they probably would have some sound quality issues. But if you know one thing about Sennheiser, even their cheap quality gear is like way ahead of the game. My bride and groom usually are the ones that will have my Sennheiser MKE-2s. Everybody else just gets one of those Rode mics and if they tear it up, not a big deal they're you know they're replaceable the sennheiser mke2 i will use to put in between the buttons of the groom we use the ursa mini mounts which are designed specifically for the sennheiser mke2 and it basically fits in there like a glove it pops right in and it's a hard capsule that you can then tape to the skin tape to the clothing and basically provide like this barrier that helps reduce noise rustling I have learned just trial and error that if you actually tape the mini mic mount to the shirt and then you tape another sticky on the opposite side and you, you basically sandwich the mic mount, this keeps the shirt in that area from moving a lot. Like it'll still have some noise rustle, but it's reduced significantly by just having it taped to the shirt uh, on both sides. Freaking nah, when the girl walks in with an itty bitty waist, I don't know all the lyrics again. So. I use one of the mini mounts for the girls as well. So my bride will actually have one of these. And instead of taping it to their skin, I actually have them tape it to the dress. This way, the opposite side is rubbing against their skin. If their chest happens to rub against it or bump up against it, you don't hear like the rustling of clothing. Um, you honestly don't hear anything because the chest tissue is really soft. So it just kind of conforms around the mic. I actually use an Ursa thigh strap. It's basically a nice piece of cloth with Velcro. It has a nice pocket design so you can slide in your transmitter. And then basically I give this to my ladies and they would wear this on their right thigh. Do not put your mic, I repeat, never put your mic on the left side of a woman because all you'll hear is their heartbeat. Take it from me, I did it and it was one and done. I never did it again. The entire day, all I heard was do 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 It was especially when she got nervous or like reading her vows, no audio, just a fast heartbeat the entire time. So hear from me, always mic your bride on the right side. It always goes on the right side and the right leg. My backup recorder is the Zoom F2. This is a really handy recorder. Again, it has locking mic connections, so you don't have to worry about your cable popping out, but it also records in 32-bit float. So you don't have to worry about setting levels or doing anything like that. I'm not like a pro at explaining 32-bit float, and if you actually do a little bit of research on like what is 32-bit float, you'll hear a lot of people referencing it as basically like raw, but for audio. To a point, that's exactly what it is. You basically have dynamic range, if you want to put it, if you want to call it that, for audio that is so broad that even the loudest of recordings can be basically turned down in post, erasing the clipping. It just, it never happens. I thought it was like a myth and I bought this recorder. I bought the Zoom F6 and I tried it. I actually did a test. I plugged my mic into it. I screamed right into it as loud as I could. Went into Premiere Pro at the time, turned the volume down. I was like blown away. Like the clipping was gone. Get yourself a recorder with 32-bit flow, especially for like weddings because people, they, they don't, present and talk in a way that they should, like they're giving like a presentation. It's one of the nervous speeches, you know, when they're reading, they may gradually get loud. They may laugh loud hysterically because, you know, the nerves get to them. They may start off really quiet and then just boom, they get loud out of nowhere. And you want to have this like flexibility and post to just control the audio at any means. The reason that I no longer plug directly into the back of the DJ speaker is because you can't control the sound. And I know you guys are thinking like, oh yeah, well the DJ is gonna set levels for you, blah, 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 blah. And look, I, I get it. The reason you don't wanna do that is because of the noise floor. And this was something that kept driving me crazy. I was like, why am I getting all this noise? I'm recording with the Zoom F6. I got 32-bit float. Why am I getting all this like, you know, shh, why am I getting all this white noise? And the reason is because when the DJs, they're controlling the sound for the room not for your recorder. If it's too low, they're gonna just crank it, regardless if someone's in the middle of giving their speech, if you know the music is halfway through the song, it, they're just gonna turn it up. The white noise is something you're gonna hear when you're trying to edit that audio into your film. You're gonna, hear, you're gonna introduce all this white noise, this ground, this floor noise, and that's what you don't want. So now I quit recording into the back of the DJ speaker. This way they can control the game. They can, you know, set all their levels and do everything they need to for the ceremony, for the reception, for the toast or for whatever. They can raise those volume controls and I don't have to worry about my recording being affected. 
Now I split the only feed going into their board, which is their mic connection. So I will split my, I will use the XLR splitter to split it from the mic and give them a feed and then I get a feed from the same source. The reason for this is because if they're getting sound, I know for a fact that I'm getting sound and vice versa. If there's no sound, then I know that I'm not getting sound. So we need to figure this out and fix it. Another reason I do it that way is because now if they control the gain in the room and they turn their levels up and you know crank it as loud as they want, it will never affect the recording because I'm getting an independent line from the mic rather than getting whatever is being sent to the speaker and then getting that. So another thing I wanna talk about that's inside my audio case that's not technically audio related, but I guess it kinda is because the Pocket 6Ks, you actually got to plug into the audio jack, so it makes sense. Um, and that's time code. I started running time code last year, and oh my god, I'm mad that I've been filming weddings for almost four years, and I never have used time code before. If you film weddings and you run more than one camera, buy yourself time code. If my second and I are filming the same thing, regardless if he's on the other side of the room and he's filming a reaction and I'm way on the other side filming the action, if I wanna sync it, it's simply a click of sync based on time code inside of DaVinci and boom, it's done in an instant. Like literally an instant, no, no more searching, trying to find the waveform and then getting that annoying alert that, oh, no matching alert found. Time code is such a time saver and you know for a fact that it's synced perfectly. It really helps reduce that slight lag that you might get because it's synced based on the waveform, but it's not like matched up by the frame. And that's where time code comes in. The system that I'm using is the UltraSync 1. The UltraSync 1 is pretty sweet because my A unit, I name all my units A, B, C. Uh, the A unit is basically the master. The B and C will pull the time code from the master uh, when, whenever they're within 200 feet. They consistently continue to rejam themselves, which is important for time code because then you don't ever have to worry about drift. For those of you that aren't familiar with time code, drift is basically the longer your time code unit has been running, it slowly falls out of sync. So rather than each clip matching as they should, they might be a frame or two off. Um, and so you'll want to rejam your time code units throughout the day to prevent this. The UltraSync 1 will consistently rejam whenever they're with, within the range of the master. And in my case, most of my wedding scenarios were always within range. But if we drift out of range, then the units themselves will continue to run time code with the internal time code clock and then rejam once they come within range of the master again. Hopefully I covered everything and answered any questions that y'all might have. Uh, there are some tricks that you can do to reduce noise rustling and I have debated on making a video about that. So I'd love to know if you guys are interested in, in knowing how I clean up the audio. It's not always perfect, but if I didn't show you the flaws, you probably would never catch it. It's like one of those things, right? Like if you don't show someone you messed up, they'll never know you messed up. Um, and so, yeah, if you guys are interested in seeing that, let me know in the comments below. Until next time, y'all keep creating and I'll see you in the next one.